Hey everybody, welcome to a, another YouTube painting tutorial. This is Andrew Broussard. Um, in front of me I have an 11 by 15 quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I'm going to saturate this paper and then I'll talk about the palette and the plans for today's painting. So I just take a medium size hake brush. And this is the Ron Ranson hake brush which I believe they have at Cheap Joe's Art Stuff. I think they also have it at Jerry's Artorama. Um, there might be one or two other places online that readily carry it. It's made by Pro Art, but this one was labeled Cheap Joe's Art Stuff, so I'm not sure um, if they had a separate line made for them, but it does say the Ron Ranson Hake. The reason I specify the Ron Ranson Hake is the fact that it, um, it's kind of pre-worn and it allows for different effects rather than just using it to layer water down. Okay, so while the paper takes on the water, I'm gonna spritz the palette and talk about what we're gonna utilize today. And with this one, I'm pretty much going to focus on uh, the light red oxide, the lizard and crimson. Those two are, I believe, Cotman brand. Then I have my burnt umber, my burnt sienna, raw sienna, lemon yellow, which I'm going to have to put more of that out in a few, um, ultramarine, and Payne's gray. So uh, today, here's the idea. I've been... Um, well, yesterday I did kind of a perspective, aerial perspective, video, atmospheric perspective. Um, those terms seem to be interchangeable with layering mountains and making an S-shape composition. S-shape meaning we have something traveling through the painting and it's making an S-shape. And it could go in reverse. It's mainly that hook behind on a layering of um, two background elements, which really seem to be quite important within it. So um, that was yesterday's painting, and I hadn't done hills or mountains in quite a while. Um, usually I'm doing uh, kind of swamp scenes, things like that. And then, so I did that painting, and then prior to that, a few days ago, I was playing around with um, Cornacridone Gold, Quin Gold, which here I am talking about the palette, and I... Neglected to talk about that. So Quin Gold, Quinacridone Gold, which seems to be, and this is something I'm going to experiment with, uh, a viable way of getting a golden sunset. And um, it does have its positives and negatives, for me at least, where when I utilize it, it will very quickly turn green, meaning that it just mixes with stuff around it readily. Um, just like lemon yellow does. Uh, it's more affected than like, let's say a uh, raw sienna. So the controllability of it for me within the wet of wet is a little difficult, but I was thinking that I'd put it in as a sunset over the mountains and we'd explore how it's going to affect and how we can deal with it as we put in another sequence of mountains. So that's kind of the idea for today's painting. So let's get this out. Paper is relatively flat. everything nice and neat and then we'll get started okay so um I'm gonna light in this Quin gold first so you can see what I'm talking about where like I said it kind of gives me a little bit of issues where I want to get that wet and wet dispersion effect but it's going to um, interact with the mountain range that I wind up putting here. 
So I'm quite curious how that's going to work in this region. Put a little bit in the sky. And as we put the sky in, you'll probably see how um, quickly it gets uh, muddled with other paints. We're going to have the water reflection down here. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna move that paint on the side. I'll probably come back to it later on. Maybe see if we have to touch up at the end or something like that. But now I'm gonna switch over to, you put a lizard and crimson in the sky. And we'll grab some ultramarine blue. Now one thing about this is that it's very vibrant and colorful right now. And I am not usually a vibrant and colorful painter. In college I was. Um, I had started off with oil paints in college. My first set of oil paints I had bought was Alizarin Crimson Ultramarine, so these two colors, and Lemon Yellow. And that's what I did all of um, my oil paintings with when I first started out. And that was when I was painting on my own, and then I started learning um, and taking art classes at college for fun. So I had done those in my dorm room and then I started taking classes on top of my uh, regular cur curriculum for art. So this is Payne's Gray. This is a very interesting sky right off the bat. Um, just kind of all over the place. I think Go for this and just let it roll. So this is definitely looser than I painted the scene yesterday. The scene is imaginary, but very, um, very, very typical uh, layering of mountains. Something that you've all probably have seen before. At a landmass right here, so just put that in. And I'm gonna grab some more dark and mix it with. So Payne's Gray mixed with a lizard and crimson, kind of a go-to type, kind of mauve type deal. We'll just get a little bit darks in the sky and see what happens. We'll leave it at that. Now, I am going to just casually put in the mountain range. It's going to be right about here. Something's vibrating with the vibration of the AC. That was weird. Okay. So it's going to be about in this region. We'll have the mountain range. We'll start layering and we'll have that all important curve taking place. In fact, I'll lift that up right in that spot. There's going to be darks down in here. Okay, 
So let's do a dry off and then we'll start putting in the mountains for real. good enough. Sorry for such a long dry time. Now, um, I did have just copious amounts of water on this painting uh, paper, and usually I will um, spend a lot more time in the wet and wet phase. And you can see that I started getting some um, kind of cauliflower and different effects due to the fact that I still had just a lot of water and there wasn't natural drying taking place. And I was kind of essentially pushing that paper around. Uh, sorry, pushing the water around the paper. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our mountains. And this is where I'm going to kind of deviate from what I usually use. And I'm going to grab uh, just a brush that'll hold a little bit more water. So this is a another rigger. Uh, the one I usually use is a one. This is a four. This is just going to help me get more onto uh, the paper at once. So this is going to be ultramarine blue mixed with light red oxide. And the purpose of this mixture is to get a purple. This is for our background most trees. Uh, not trees, I'm sorry, mountains. You could tell that I don't paint mountains very often as I'm going to refer to them hills, uh, trees, so I'm gonna mess that up quite a bit. So this is these background guys right here. It's almost more water than anything else. Very little pigment taking place. You could feed it into the ridge. Uh, one thing I need to do is get some reference material and see how, or just look at other painters that have done this and see how they did a play of light and dark to get the different um, capturing of the sun and how it catches that. I feel like I'm not, um, I'm good today. I feel like I'm still a little sleepy. I apologize for that. I'm just putting this guy in. This isn't the final one right here. This is just um, for me to start getting the shape. Just because I think that this overlap that'll wind up happening, this will be the bottom edge of the hills, mountains that come along. That S shape is super important. 
Okay, we can, let's uh, do a dry off. So we're gonna go back and forth between drying and laying this stuff in. If you want, you could take some slightly stronger pigments and feed that in. Get a little bit of variation in this background one. And then we're gonna utilize that concept more and more as we work our way forward. Okay, so here's this dry off. Now, I will take an even lighter mixture and go above this guy. I want it even lighter, almost pure water. And here's one that's even further back. Now, I'm putting this guy in at this point because first of all, this one's dry. So I could put on this side and this side rather than going back and forth with the blow dryer. Um, so less blow drying taking place and it's better for you all and better for me. Once all this um, ends, you know, like the lockdowns and all that stuff and uh, stay at home orders, things like that. I'll be able to go back to my ENT and talk to him. Went to him um, almost a year ago, no, less than a year ago. And I had allergies as a kid. And um, I was getting sinus infections, sick all the time. And now, as a school teacher, go to pep rallies, things like that, and the pep rallies would just hurt my ears so much, just the noise would hurt. And I thought, you know, damage to my ears from listening to loud music as a kid, you know, stuff like that. Um, but then, like, it was crazy, like flushing of a toilet. Even my own voice would start hurting my ears. And um, I was like, what's going on? And they haven't like done a scan yet or anything like that. And they gave me allergy shots, and I'm doing all that. It's doing great. But I think we have a flu a I have fluid buildup in my um, I think it's called the stasia tubes. I'll tell you about it in a second. All right, so I'm going to take this blue mix, this purplish mix, and as we come forward, we add more uh, warmer colors. So we have the purple from ultramarine blue and the light red oxide. And I'm going to mix in burnt sienna to warm it up. So I can increase the, uh, my pigment concentration as well as, like I said, do what's called warm up by adding in burnt sienna. Anyway, story about my ears, I'm sorry. So I'm going to just create this mountain range. In fact, I might even bring it up front and bring it like that. And then make it more of a mountain than a hill. But you can do rolling hills just by layering them. Um, so, yeah, it was crazy. Like, my own voice was hurting my ears. Like, it was making it feel like my head was underwater or something. And um, it just became very apparent that it was not typical ear damage. That I think there's, like, the fluid and whatnot in my ears. So um, the blow dryer itself will hurt my ears at times. Um, I've noticed that I have to sometimes cock my head up in the air and look straight up as I blow dry the painting because that's the only position, I don't know if it's the angle that it is in relationship to the blow dryer or a shifting of fluids or what, but my ears do not hurt if I blow dry like that. Okay, 
So hopefully it's apparent that as we brought this one forward and layered those guys, um, we created it where it was more pigment and like I said, warmer, where I mixed in the um, burnt sienna into this mixture. Now there is no right and wrong formula for how much we're adding in. Um, here's a kind of warmer still. I'm gonna put right there. And we could play around and feed into it and really start getting contours on this closer one so we'll see more detail. In fact, I'm gonna to switch to the thinner rigger in a moment and put um, hopefully what will be apparent uh, trees on the closer one on the top. So it's still wet and wet. It gives us that nice soft effect. I'll tell you what, it's weird painting like this because as you know, I use mainly just two brushes, the rigger and the, um, the hake brush. But I think what might be good and it might be a good lesson in and of itself is um, to step outside your comfort zone, uh, find what you like, and, and, and that's a, that's the thing. Okay, so with painting, and I'm just bringing this a little bit wetter down as a reflection in the water. So with painting, with art, you can take it as far or as little far as you want to go. Uh, for example, um, for fun, and I have a lot of different hobbies, I used to make homemade wine, homemade beer, homemade uh, mead, and with that, I would, um, you know, you can mix different concentrations, do different things, do different experiments, and it was just so much fun. Um, but definitely ran out of room for it and ran out of time to do that activity. And I have a friend that does it, so if I ever want to do it, I could just go to his place and um, do that again. Because he has just a whole place set up for it, it's a lot easier. Anyway, um, but with it, you could literally just throw the equipment, uh, materials together. Uh, you can do uh, measurement readings every day. You could say what the ambient temperature is at the time. You can uh, check what's called the specific gravity of it, which is a um, measure of what, uh, sugar content. And sugar content, as it goes down, if I'm not mistaken, will, um, yeah, as sugar content goes down, which I think is a measurement of specific gravity, will help let you know what the alcohol content is because it transfers from one to the other. Um, that's like kind of an oversimplification, I think. You could do all those things, or literally you could just mix the ingredients in a bucket and let it sit, and obviously you don't want to get like botulism or anything like that, so you just make sure there's nothing there. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can have a similar result. And what I'm saying is with painting and with any hobby is you can delve as far deep as you want or not. Um, and there's nothing wrong with either decision. You can paint for fun. You can paint um, you know, to make videos for other people, things like that, which is for me fun. I'm just putting little dots on here to give the illusion of trees. This is um, a technique from like Chinese painting that I learned. I'll have to look at um, watercolorists of the 1900s and see if they had just done something as simple as this. Putting the little dots right there. They probably did. Okay, now let's switch over to this side. I, this is still wet right here. I'm gonna do this foreground one. So I'm kind of switching around with these layers, um, mainly so that I don't produce a super, super long video and uh, bore you all to death or um, turn you guys off from watching this. 
this is definitely getting back to pure watercolors itself where I've been doing a lot of watercolors um, like I said swamp scenes things like that and I look at what's called the tonalism school of painting and in my personal drive I've been trying to apply tonalism to watercolor which there was tonalism painters but I'm trying to apply more of a contemporary feel to it I've also been looking at the Hudson River Valley painters um, but anyway yeah, so there's pure watercolors, and that was big in, what, England and the northeastern United States, I believe. It probably was all around, but they had, you know, prominent figures in those areas. And the two that I constantly refer to were Ron Ranson and uh, James Fletcher Watson. I'm just making a warmer concentration. In fact, I can move over to my raw sienna into this mixture if I want. But ultimately, I'm just trying to get it darker and warmer and closer. So James Fletcher Watson, he was prolific with a lot of books and whatnot and painted throughout the United Kingdom and then there's a book where I think he was like literally traveling the world and had painted in different locations and um, he has a lot of good books he I don't know if I mentioned it you know passed away and I think he would spend maybe like an hour to two hours in the, uh, on a painting he had a palette that was a little bit larger than this but I learned a lot from his books and I added stuff to my palette and there's stuff that I play around with whenever I change things. So yeah, he was a pure watercolorist and would, I guess, essentially paint in this style. And then there's Ron Ranson, who, you know, once again, uh, some gentleman who passed away. And he passed away quite recently. I think it was only three years ago. So this is 2020, I think, you know, a few years ago. And he was a proponent of the pure watercolors, but also essentially a fast and loose type style where he'd use the hake for a lot of textures and whatnot and a lot of different effects. So he was essentially minimizing the tools that were being utilized within painting. And he kind of brought painting home to a lot of people and made it easier. I want to differentiate this edge right here. So I'm just putting a little bit darker in there just to change that layer. So Ron Ranson, I guess a way to think of him was, I guess kind of like a, um, a Bob Ross making paint, painting accessible to the everyday man. And he had a lot of uh, books and videos as well. And then eventually he wrote books talking about other painters either during that time period or slightly prior to him. And those books are really good as well. Um, he, he has just had some really good stuff. Um, you could readily find some of his books on eBay. And if you haven't, I would suggest getting them. You know, you can get them for like three or four bucks. I don't even have my phone on silent. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so he had really good books and whatnot. And for cheap, like like I said, three or four bucks. Books. Bucks for a book. And some of his stuff, some of his books are super expensive. There's some that I'd love to get my hands on. Um, there's a book that he did about... What was the name? Of course, the moment I start talking about it, I'm going to forget. When it comes to me, I'll mention it. And that's kind of hypocritical. Like, not hypocritical, but like, funny me saying that I'd love to get it, and then I forget the name. This is just a little raw sienna.
Okay, let me do a dry off so I can paint up in here. Like I said, kind of been working in reverse in different, um, instead of directly front to back, mainly so that I can minimize drying times and whatnot. So it's literally just leaving that space for me to go back in and paint. So I'm going to mix this a little bit since it's further back, a little bit more on the bluer side. It's lighter, it's definitely not bluer though. Just a little bit more. It's dangerously close to the um, color of this closer one. It might wind up melding together. And if that happens, I'll make it into one piece and I'll put a tree line on it. That's probably what I'm gonna have to do. And right along that kind of sharp edge ridge, I get some strong pigment, just feed it in. Well, let that be a tree line since it's closer. some paints gray in there. This guy's dry right here, but I can model some trees. This is, like I said, this is a number four rigger, so it's thicker than my other rigger, so the side brush effect is a little different for me. Get some paints gray. Start right along here. Pretty excited about this one, um, because it's looking like a, like I said, typical watercolor landscape. Which, like I said, you know, I've been delving in different directions, so it's nice to be able to somewhat achieve that classic look from the 1800s, not uh, 1900s. And I can mix ultramarine. And you could go back and forth all day and play around with this. right there. And bring down the dark for that.
trees. Back there. Okay, so let's um, dry this guy off. here I'm gonna grab the rigger uh, the hake I want to achieve a um, I've been using this word a lot lately so hopefully it's the right word the scintillating effect the kind of light effect but I want to utilize that quinacridone gold that we had up here as well as a lizard and crimson across this so let's see so whenever you do this you're gonna want your hake to be relatively dry, a little bit flared out. In yesterday's painting, I took Payne's Gray and did this. Let's come across. And, um, you might be seeing how it hits that kind of greenish look for me. And that was one of the issues that I faced with Quinn Gold, um, which unfortunately, and I was talking about earlier about uh, simplification of what you utilize and how Ron Ranson, what, two or three brushes, and then James Fletcher Watson, a little bit more than two br uh, brushes, a little bit more than like eight pigments on the palette. Um, I would have to start incorporating more things on my desk to keep it clean just for that Quinn Gold. Let's um let's clean that off and let's get the Elizabeth Crimson. Okay. Got it all flared out. Come from the edge. Bring it across. We're just trying to get that sunset effect. Of the rippling water. Then I'm gonna do a quick dry and I'm gonna go over it with uh, Payne's Gray. Okay, Payne's Gray. I want this Payne's Gray to be closer to the land masses to get more of a um, recession. Okay, so that's somewhat interesting. Let's, uh, while we're wet and wet, well, kind of wet and wet, now I'm going to do that foreground shape that I had previously. This is raw sienna and ultramarine blue. I've been kind of muting my raw sienna for the grounds lately. I just feel that the pure raw raw sienna for me just just doesn't seem to work. There's just something that I'm not getting the way I want with it. And whenever I have that wet in here, 
I can feed in other colors. This is the burnt sienna. I also feel the same way with the burnt sienna where at times it looks, I don't know. I said at the beginning, it's very um, not like me to paint um, colorful. This is Payne's Gray. My paper is starting to take quite a bit of beating. I think a little bit of water is traveling underneath the edge of the paper and getting um, underneath the paper. And I think that's been causing an issue. So I need to uh, eventually get another board to connect to. Um, yesterday I had a tree mass up here, so I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to try not to block out so much of this background, but just the way it is. I'm going to have to dry off right in there because yesterday we had too much of a softening take place as we passed over it. This is just paint that I just had on the um, palette from the brush a second ago. Okay. Let's do a quick dry off so I can get through this part. Okay, let me, all right, since we've been using this rigger, the number four. Let me play around with that and um, we'll see if it gets what co-opted into a more daily routine. You could do tree trunks with anything. You could use the hake and you see that in videos. You could use the rigger and you can use, you could use any type of brush. Use just the tip of the brush, and the same thing with the um, regular rigger. Use it as like uh, calligraphy type strokes. This is where your own style starts to come out with motions like that. Any type of tree, I always like to ground it. Create a way for it to go there. Um, you could also put shadows in down here. There is, um, I think it's the right person. So I, I mentioned Ron Ranson. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Ron Ranson Disciples, where we all get together and paint and um, share our paintings and whatnot. And it's all in the fast and loose style. I think it's Ian. I think it's Ian Campbell is his name. He uh, does amazing shadow work, like lights and darks and stuff. Oh man. Um, he, I don't think he does any videos. And if he did, they would be uh, invaluable. They'd be, um, like, let me tell you, this stuff that this guy does is, is really nice. And that's the cool thing. You get to the point where you can watch and go or flip through the, the Facebook page and you start thinking, oh, that's a, that's a Joe Menza painting, you know, and that's Joe Menza. Or that's, um, Lois Davidson, and you know it's Lois Davidson, or that's Posey Gaines, um, and people have been starting to follow my tutorials, and you'd be like, oh, I recognize it, like that's off of that tutorial. So it's um, it's really cool, it's really exciting, that's really fun um, group. So I would definitely encourage you to join that Facebook page, Ron Ranson Disciples. Um, other good Facebook pages for artists, uh, watercolor, uh, watercolor techniques and tips. It might be in reverse, it might be tips and techniques. There's um, Rick's watercolor page for the Friends of Rick. That's um, a lot of people have a lot of different things on there. I'm gonna darken up these trees now. Payne's gray. Let's get some lemon yellow.
that'll give me a little bit of a greenish. What other page? There's watercolor addicts. I think people will just um, more or less just kind of post what they've painted on there. Um, watercolor sketchers. That's another good one. Everything besides the Ron Ranson one, though, is Ron Ranson one is mainly just city scenes, buildings, and landscape. Other ones will have a wide variety of uh, painting subjects. All right, I'm gonna get a dark. I'm gonna mix the dark. My go-to dark is just like a burnt umber, Payne's gray, ultra mix. Just getting pure dark pigment. This is the number one rigger, so. It's one that I'm used to controlling. But I had used the number four just because of the higher um, water holding ability. Both brushes were the silver black, silver velvet. Yeah, silver black velvet. Oh, now would be a good time to get my spiel. Oh, if you like my videos, um, and if you're interested, I would love for you to consider supporting me on Patreon. There's a link down below. I have two different tiers, both very cheap. It helps me buy art supplies and whatnot. Also, for the higher tier, I have some exclusive tutorial content. If you are unable to um, join Patreon or unwilling to support, that is totally acceptable I totally understand and there's no hard feelings just you all watching these videos means a lot to me second uh, I do have Etsy link down below um, I often post paintings that I've painted up on there for sale however not every single one of them is up there mainly because I would go broke in listing fees because I paint so much um, yeah also you know on the YouTube page please like subscribe follow um, if you have any questions comments I would love to hear from you I try to respond to everything that people post if I don't respond it's just because I did not get a notification or I missed a notification let's build up this Foliage a little bit darker, paints gray. And you may think, oh, you spent so much time painting those mountains back there, and now you're covering them up. Well, it's just um, adding to the depth of the whole scene, and it's adding to, um, for me, what I think is important is building up this imaginary place. And, um, you know, in my mind, I'm able to travel through it able to see the pass um, just creates a fuller th uh, image for me I think we're about done we could put a bird or two in the sky uh, I'm going to omit the gentleman in the rowboat that I've been putting in recently um, could put it Let's um, dry off, see if anything else needs to be done, and I'll sign it, and then I'll put a mat over it for you all to see what it looks like.
sign right down in here. I'm gonna wind up going to eat some cereal and maybe some leftovers and then I'm gonna come back and paint. I think my next painting today will be um, that building that I need to paint. Let's put that right about here. Okay, so here's the final results. Um, I hope you enjoyed, and I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day.